Okay, good morning. And into week 10, I believe it is. Um, so we're going to keep right on talking our goal for today. Maybe today and tomorrow, we'll see, is to find and classify local extrema. And hopefully you've all been good students and watched that video I put up when I was away for jury selection, but just on the off chance, Local extrema. Say that we have a graph. Say that we have a graph that looks like this. Um, and we're looking at this point here. That point looks like a minimum. I mean, the curve comes down, it hits what looks like a minimum value, and then it goes back up again. But it isn't a minimum, because we then later get below it. I mean, that's not a minimum. It's not an absolute minimum because it's not the absolutely minimal value that the curve takes on. But it still is, <clears throat> uh, it still is something, even if it's not an absolute minimum. What it is, is a local minimum. <laughs> And a local minimum occurs if erasing the part of the graph that's far away, far away in quotation marks, because I'm not going to formally define it, but if you erase the part of the graph that's far away from the point, and that turns it into an absolute minimum, then it was a local minimum in the first place. And you can define a local maximum in a similar way. Um, this value here looks like a maximum. The curve comes up, hits a maximum, starts going down. Except that that thing that I called a maximum certainly isn't an absolute maximum. You see that the curve gets above it. It's a local maximum for the same reason that that other point was a local minimum. If you erase the part of the curve that's far away, again in scare quotes, from this point, it turns into a maximum. So we've got, did not mean to do that, but sort of reproducing the curve as best as I can from memory. We've got a local max and a local min. And of course, the textbook segregates these topics. I mean, it introduces both the local extrema and absolute extrema in the same section, section 4.1. But then it does this sort of weird thing where in section 4.1, we learn to find absolute extrema on closed intervals. 
then there's the detour, section 4.2, where we're suddenly talking about the mean value theorem. And it's only section 4.3 when we're coming back to local extrema. In practice, finding local extrema and finding absolute extrema are kind of intertwined. Let's illustrate this with an example, which we will not finish right away, but which tries to illustrate what I'm talking about. F of X equals X E to the X will be the function in question. And the question will be, does this function have absolute <laughs> exodrema and if it does where does it have these absolute extrema? Well, let's investigate this question graphically. The proliferation of graphing technology is making parts of calculus seem a bit old fashioned. If we want to answer this question, we can take a look at the graph. And I mean, it's always possible that if we just zoomed out a little more, this graph would do something weird. I mean, it looks like it's just going up, 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 but maybe if we zoom out just one more time, we'd find that this curve hits a maximum, turns around, and then starts going down. And that is, you know, in spite of what I said, that is the weakness of trying to rely just entirely on technology. Yeah. But from the graph, it looks like this does not have a maximum. I mean, just from what we're seeing, it looks like this thing goes up and up and up and never achieves any kind of maximum value. By contrast, it looks like it does have a minimum. It looks like this point here is some kind of, well, some kind. It looks like it's an absolute minimum. You see the curve is hugging the axis, hugging the axis, hugging the axis. Then it comes down, hits a minimum value, and goes back. So our curve looks something like this. And we're looking for an absolute extrema. We're looking for an absolute minimum. And we think it's there. 
So we can find it, right? I mean, we know how to find absolute extrema. That was section 4.1. But we have to hold our horses because in section 4.1, we were explicitly looking at these closed intervals. And we do not have any kind of closed interval in this problem. I mean, the function in question is defined from negative infinity to positive infinity, and we haven't been told any difference. We haven't been told, oh, it's defined everywhere, but we're only looking at it on some closed interval. So what can we do? Well, this absolute extrema that we're looking for, this absolute minimum, is certainly also a local minimum. I mean, you erase all of the graph except for the parts near that value. That point we're looking for is definitely a local minimum. So to summarize the conversation so far, we cannot use 4.1 because we're not working on any kind of closed interval. But this absolute minimum is also a local minimum. So if we had some kind of way to find local minima, we could use that technique to find the absolute minima. Thus, going back to what I said earlier, the textbook segregates these topics. Absolute extrema, 4.1, local extrema, 4.3. And the reason the textbook does this, I mean, I'm not just making fun of it. It does it because the techniques are different. So it does make sense to present these topics differently. Never the, or in different sections, I should say. Nevertheless, as we've seen from this example, they are closely related. And section 4.3 is going to be dedicated to questions like that. I should say, I mean, this is probably obvious, but the function I picked to introduce all of this has a minimum. It doesn't have a maximum. This entire discussion could apply if it were reversed. I mean, we also want to find the bull maxima. Does anybody have any questions before we start going into the nitty gritty? The, okay, so how do we find local minima, details, local maxima too, details of the section? If not,
And let me state the goal. It's to find and classify local exodrema. And this word, classify, we're going to come back to. That word will make more sense once we've stated a few more facts. Classify. The word will make more sense. In fairness to me, I think I was trying to do that, and the whiteboard just didn't uh, didn't pick up those fast few lines. Um. So that's our goal, and. The starting sort of starting comment is the following. And I mean, I don't know why I've decided to call this an idea. Let me clarify that this is a true idea. Local. Exodrema can only occur at critical values. And let's very briefly remind ourselves we saw critical values back in section 4.1. A critical value is a value where the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. So this is a starting point. That's, that's what I was trying to get at here. It's a starting point. But we're going to have to do some more work to really make this work for us. Let's return, without saying anything more, let's return to the previous. problem, and let's try to connect the material of this frame to the material of this frame to work with me, here we go, to the graph we've seen on Desmos.com. Let's try to put everything we've done so far together. This has an absolute minimum. We've seen that graphically on Desmos. Which is also a local minimum. 
He made that observation a few frames back, which can only occur at a critical value. So if we wanted to find this absolute minimum, our strategy is going to be, okay, find the local minimum. And our strategy for finding this local minimum is that a local minimum can only occur at a critical value. So let's ask ourselves, what are the critical values of this function? That's remind ourselves of what the function is, first of all. The one downside of these whiteboards, we can't just scroll something in the corner and keep it there forever. To find the critical values, we need the derivative When you use the quotient rule with these e to the x's, it always looks like you're forgetting to take a derivative, but e to the x is its own derivative, remember. So f of x is two functions multiplied together, and we are correctly using the quotient rule not quotient, product rule. And for simplicity, we can pull an e to the x out and we get that. And as far as <coughs> critical values go, A critical value could exist if the derivative doesn't. And it's, I don't know if this is obvious or if you need to get a little more experience. This derivative always exists and it always exists because one plus X is defined on all of the real numbers. There's nothing you can do to that that will give you a division by zero error or the square root of a negative number. There's nothing you can do to the one over X that's going to break it. And E to the X is the same. It's defined on all of the real numbers. It never breaks. So if you have two products that are both defined everywhere and you multiply them together, the product is defined everywhere. So this is not applicable to this particular problem. The derivative always exists. And I would say that the majority of problems, the majority of functions share this property. For most functions, the derivative exists everywhere, but we still have to check it. 
The derivative equaling zero is the other way we could have a critical value. So we can hopefully solve this equation. There are a few ways we could go about it. We could use the zero product property, or we could divide by e to the x. Why can we divide by e to the x, but not one plus x? I mean, why are we doing this particular division? Well, it's because e to the x is never zero. So this division can never give us a division by zero error. Whereas dividing by one plus x could give us division by zero. X could be negative one. Um, zero divided by e to the x is still zero. One plus x equals zero. X equals negative one. So this is our only critical <coughs> value. Returning to this example, the absolute minimum, which is also a local minimum, can only occur at a critical value. Well, there's only one critical value. That's at negative one. So the absolute minimum can only occur at negative one. And if we take a look at Desmos, Desmos agrees. The critical value occurs at x equals negative one, y equals approximately negative 0 0.368. Okay, but you know, we've, we've successfully finished this problem. What we haven't done is put a method on the board for finding critical values, or rather for finding local extrema. So we have the idea as it's been presented in this problem, but we need to formalize it. We also haven't really gained any insight about this word classify. Let's try, I know it's hard to do in practice, but let's try to forget everything that we just did. And let's look at x, e to the x, with a fresh set of Ah, is. And let's state a problem. Find any 
local extrema. Then classify. Here's this word finding making sense as either local minima or local maxima. And we are not going to be able to finish this problem at present without ultimately making resource to Desmos. But let's approach the problem anyway. We want to find local extrema. We know it's written down somewhere here. We know that local extrema can only occur at critical values. So for this problem, our starting point should be To find the critical values. And I'm not going to repeat the work. We already did this less than 10 minutes ago. And we found that there was one critical value. And that critical value is x equals one. That's supposed to be negative one. Negative one, it is. Thank you. Um, so if we now try to forget what's come before, though, the following question is. The following question does not have an obvious answer. Is this critical value a local max? Or is it a local min? Or maybe, It's neither local max nor local min. So finding critical values is a starting point, but then finally clarifying that word, we need some method of classifying our critical values. So let me summarize what's come already. Our goal is to find local extrema. Step one is to find critical values. Step two is to classify.
those critical values? Are they local maxima? Are they local minima? Are they neither local maxima nor local minima? <clears throat> So our goal in the remaining 15 minutes is to give us some kind of method or some kind of technique for finding these, um, or rather for classifying these local extrema. Does anybody have any questions going in to the second, third, or whatever of this class? Then there are actually a few ways you could classify the bull extrema. I mean, one obvious way would just be to graph the thing. I, I don't think that would satisfy sort of the traditionalists or textbook authors, but it is deniably true that once you plug this thing into Desmos, you can immediately see, okay, there's a critical value at negative one, that's around here, okay, this is a minimum. So there is that. Obviously, Newton and people like that were operating long before calculator technology. So we'll at least introduce, and we will do some examples with the kind of classic method for finding these critical events for classifying these critical values. It's called the first derivative test. Um, first derivative in this context is supposed to be distinguishing it from the second derivative, although it is also the first of two derivative tests we're going to learn, so it works both ways. The first derivative test comes, as the name implies, from looking at derivatives, and it's based on the following observation. Suppose you have a local maximum, let's say. This local maximum occurs at a critical value. This local maximum occurs where the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. And um, to the left of this local maximum, over here, notice that the function is increasing. And an increasing function has a positive derivative. Then over here, to the right of that local maximum, the function 
is decreasing. And a decreasing function has a negative derivative. So the derivative went from being a positive to being negative at this critical value. Now suppose you have a local minimum. This local minimum occurs at a critical value. That is to say that f prime equals zero or f prime does not exist. And I mean, you think of this graph kind of like a book. So you go uh, to the left of the critical value, reading left to right, and you ask yourself what the graph is doing. And you say, well, the graph is decreasing. So the derivative is negative. Then you ask what's happening to the right of the critical value. Well, the graph is increasing. So the derivative is positive. So at this local minimum, the derivative is changing sign. It's going from negative to positive. So at the local max, the derivative went from positive to negative. At the local min, the derivative goes from negative to positive. What about a critical value that is neither a local map nor a local min. An example that we've seen of this is the cubic polynomial f of x equals x cubed. This does have a critical value at zero. Now, write it all out, but a particular reason for this critical value is that the derivative is zero. And we can go to the left of the critical value. And this function is increasing. So the derivative is positive. And we can go to the right of this critical value. And the derivative function is increasing. So the derivative is positive. Then at this critical value, that is neither max nor min, the derivative didn't change sign. It was positive to the left, it was positive to the right. And this gives us the first derivative 
So let C be a critical value. So when we are performing the first derivative test, we're reading this graph like a book, reading from left to right. And we're going to look at the derivative near C. And there are three things that could happen to the derivative. It could be positive to the left of C. At C, it changes sign, and now it's negative. And this means that C is a local max. Or the derivative could be negative to the left of C. At C, it changes sign, and now it's positive. And that makes C a local mean. Or it might be that the derivative doesn't change. The derivative was positive to the left and it's still positive on the right. Or the derivative was negative to the left and is still negative to the right. And in that case, C is not a local extremal. So that's what the first derivative test says. As far as how to actually use the first derivative test, we construct what we call a side chart. And it looks like that's going to have to wait until tomorrow. <laughs> so we will finish this section up, do examples and so on tomorrow. And we'll see you then right under.